Good morning. Yes, it is still morning. I had to think about that for a second. Welcome to Madison Campus Church. Welcome all of our members, all of our visitors, all of our internet viewers. We're so happy that you're here with us today worshiping together. I have a couple of announcements. If for some reason you heard me say that there was visitors potluck at first service, I tricked you. Ha ha. Uh, there's no visitors potluck today. Um, tomorrow, though, there is a church work bee, and that starts at 10 a.m., and it goes till 2 p.m. Uh, please, if you're able, show up and help us make the outside of our church look beautiful. Um, September 8th, we are having a birthday party for everyone. Uh, it is our birthday social. I think we're going to have, like, a table and a birthday cake for every month of the year, which is really cool, um, but we do need a few volunteers who are willing to decorate for the April table and the September table and also make a cake for July. So <clears throat> we want to include everyone in that. Uh, call Jennifer Taylor, uh, see your newsletter for more details on that if you're totally confused by what I'm saying. Just remember September 8th birthday party here. Uh, the church office will be closed on Monday for the holiday. And lastly, if you are missing a Bible, it's probably in our deacon's room if you left it here. So check that out on your way out today. And yeah, welcome to Madison Campus Church. We love God, love people, and serve the world around here. And we're just glad you're here today. Morning, church. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we take some time to greet your neighbors? So, so look to the person next to you, smile, tell your name. Uh, tell, them who you, tell them who you are, or if you don't know them, or if you know them, just say good morning. You, yes, you can get off your seat. Don't be shy. Yes. There you go. There you go, and as you go back to your seat now, I will ask you to join us and sing uh, together with us this hymn that you should probably know, but if you don't, the lyrics are on the screen anyway, so sing with us, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name.
I want to invite all the lovely children to come forward for the children's story. And if you would take out your dollar bills and uh, $100 bills and your $1,000 bills, I think they actually exist. And if you happen to bring one, you can give that out to the children. But the children come down for the children's story now. It's okay to get fives and twenties. I thought I saw a thousand dollar bill, but it was just a one dollar bill. I want to tell you a story today about a very dangerous animal. Um, now, it's not very dangerous here in the United States, but it's dangerous in Africa. As a matter of fact, do you know that in, in, the, in the United States, hardly anyone ever gets bit by a poisonous snake? Hardly anybody. Now, sometimes they do, but very rarely do they ever die. But over there in Africa, you can get bit by a very poisonous snake, and it can kill you. And a lot of people, that happens to. And I want to tell you a story about Muita. Muita, he lived in the Congo area where there is what we call the black mamba. He's a big snake. I mean big. Like if you can imagine a black mamba, it's so long. It could be from this end of this pew all the way down to this right here. That's a long snake. But, you know, look at the, you can see the picture of the snake up there, but he's really not black. He's more like he's grayish, brownish. Sometimes they can be an olive color. And he sort of looks like a cobra, but he's not quite. But he has that little, the little flap there. Um, that is the black mamba. But you say, well, why is he the black mamba? That's when he opens his mouth. Then you see the black inside. That's pretty scary, huh, the black mamba. And let me tell you, Muita's... Muita was always very cautious about the black mamba. That was something that you never wanted to have happen to you. But you know what? Muita came to know about Jesus. And he, his whole, his, uh, not his whole family, but his mom and him, they became Seventh-day Adventists. They came in love with Jesus. And Muita wanted to, to know more about Jesus. And, and uh, he had the privilege and the opportunity to go to school at the Adventist school. One problem, one very long problem, is he had to go through the jungle to get to school, miles through the jungle every day, and guess what was in the jungle? The black mambas are in the jungle, and you know what? He would every day, he'd get his books, he'd get his lunch, which usually just, you know, a few oranges and maybe some crackers, and he'd put them in his pocket and he'd head off uh, to, to go to school, and he would sing and he would pray as he walked through the path that led to the school. This one particular day, Moita was singing along, Jesus loves me, and he was singing. And all of a sudden, he looked down, and there, right in front of him, was a mouse. No, I wish it was a mouse. He wished it was a mouse. You know what it was? It was a black mamba, and it had its, it was all raised. It was looking right, and he was looking at the black mamba, and he said, Jesus, please help me. And just then, the black mamba stuck out, and he got him right in the leg, and then it went off. Now, the black mamba, when he gets you, that's it. It's not very long before the poison starts to set in, and he just dropped to his knees, and he was like, oh, no, Jesus, please help me. And he waited to feel the poison, and he waited, and he waited, and then he started getting tired of waiting, and then he realized nothing was happening. He's like, what's happening? I just got bit by the black mamba. I'm supposed to die. What's going on? And then he reached over there where the black mamba had bit him. The black mamba got the orange. 
he pulled out the orange. It wasn't orange anymore. It was more like a greenish looking thing. God had protected Muita from the black mamba. And instead the black mamba got the orange and didn't give him. Do you know what Muita did right then and there? He knelt down right there with that ugly looking orange in his hand. And he said, thank you, Jesus, for protecting me with your angels. The Bible tells us in Psalms 91, 11, that he will give his angels to give charge and watch over us. Do you know that each one of you has an angel that looks out for you? Yes, we should pray every day, God, protect me and send the angels to take care of me. Let's bow our heads. Lord, this morning, thank you for all these beautiful children. And uh, we just want to take this moment to say, Jesus, we want to give you our lives. We want to ask you to forgive us of sin. And we want to ask you to send your angels in a special way to protect us. Thank you that we have angels that protect us like the angel protected Muita that day from the black mamba. And protect us, Lord. Watch over us. Bless our families. Bless the rest of this church service. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can go back to your seats now. here that can tell me how many ministries this church has no I don't know exactly how many either but I do know they start from children's ministries then they go to youth ministries and then it's young adults and then it's adults then we have MCE which is a ministry of this church and we have Madison Academy, which is also a ministry. We have the 403. I couldn't name them all. And you know something else? This church has electricity. So every Sabbath when I come in here and it's hot outside, there's air conditioner and it's cool in here. In the winter, when it's cold outside, I come in here and it's nice and warm and toasty. When I get real thirsty, I just go to the water fountain, and there flows the water. These things just happen. I don't know how they happen. No, let me tell you how they happen. They happen by our contributions to church budget, and that is today's um, offering, church budget. So please give generously. And uh, would the deacons please come forward? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that you bless us everyone every day. And we thank you for those blessings and for the many times that you take care of us. We ask that you take our faithful tithe and offerings and send them to where you would like these monies to go, not us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
broken Do you feel the shadows deepen But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through Do you wish that you could see it all made new
Good morning. How many of you had a perfect week? No trials, no temptations, no difficulties. I see a lot of hands. You know, we go through life. Everybody has trials, tribulation. Everybody has problems. We do have some victories along the way, but we all are in need of prayer. This morning, I'm thinking of these people listed that have need of prayer. We have many who have cancer, one needing a triple transplant. We don't realize what other people are going through. Our beloved brethren are suffering. We need to keep them in our prayers. And there's one name that I don't think I see up there on that list, a young lady by the name of Cecilia Garcia, evidently had an accident with the Acros at this week, in fact, I think it was Thursday or Friday, and broke her femur, complete fracture. I was told just a few minutes ago by Sister Vega that she will be going home from the hospital this afternoon. That's quick. Praise the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for her quick healing and think of her family and all these others in prayer. Show as far as possible, kneel before our Father. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we recognize how unworthy we really are. Lord, our only worthiness is through your Son. And Lord, we want to thank you for the blessing that you have given us in him. We want to thank you for the blessings that you have given us in this message that we so proudly are trying to hail to the world around us. Father, we think of each one of these people who are suffering. We think of their needs and their families' needs, because not one suffers, but many. Lord, come into our hearts. Help us to remember them in our prayers, that you are reminded of their needs. Not that you need to be reminded, but that we need to be reminded that we have a part to play. Father, we ask especially that you'll continue to be with little Celia. We pray that you'll continue to guide and direct as she heals and mends. Father, I'd like to pray for each and every one out here, the trials, the tribulations they're going through. Father, we want to thank you for those because those help us to grow. Those help the goal to be purified. And yet, Lord, we need your support. We need your help. We can't go through the trials alone. Help us to lean on you. And Father, we want to thank you so much for the many ministries this church has for the many people who are willing to give of their time and their talents to do what they can that your word may be fulfilled here on this earth. Thank you for those, lady, Lord. And we pray especially that you'll continue to guide and direct them. And for our own ministerial staff here, Father, we uphold them to you. Give them strength. Give them courage. Give them knowledge and wisdom. And Father, we ask that you'll be with our speaker today, that his words won't be his words, that his words will be your words. We've come to learn of you, Lord. Open our minds that we may. For Christ's sake, we ask and pray. Amen.
Good morning. Or, yeah, it's still morning. I have like three minutes left of good morning. You know, I feel like um, every time Pastor Ken doesn't want to preach on like a subject, he's just like, I'm, I'm leaving for the weekend. Someone else do this. Good luck. And then he leaves. So in case you're watching, Ken, that shout out is for you, my friend. <laughs> Talking about starting points uh, today and a starting point. And every single one of us has a starting point. Faith has a starting point. Life has a starting point. As I said, first service, some of us were started on purpose. Uh, some of us were started on accident. But regardless of how you were started, uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here worshiping with us, and we're glad that you're here to hopefully learn and journey with us uh, this this morning and into this afternoon. Um, If you brought your Bible, like your your hard, actual paper Bible, I know these are like rare commodities. They sell them in bookstores every now and then. But if you have it, today is actually a really good day to have it. If you don't have one, uh, there's some in front of your pews. And if you don't have one of those, if you have a cell phone, a nice electronic one, I would encourage you to please get it out because we're actually going to be going through several passages. Uh, My goal today, my goal today is to hopefully... um, clear some things up and connect several pieces of scripture together into one cohesive story. Um, The Bible tells one unifying story. That is the story, the beautiful story of Jesus Christ and how he plans to redeem the world back to himself. Uh, That is the main Bible story that we hear throughout the entire Bible. Uh, So it's really awesome. Today, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verses 1 and 2. And then I'm going to give several background things that hopefully will connect all the pieces together. And we'll tie a nice little bow with it. And then you can go home and be like, what in the world did he talk about? If in the midst of today you feel lost, no problem. Uh, We have this thing on the internet, and as long as the internet is still up and running, you can go back and review it. If you fall asleep during the message, you can go back and review it. If you have a hard time uh, falling asleep tonight or tomorrow night, and you fell asleep today during the message, just play that thing again, and I'll put you right back to sleep. Uh, Win-win, either way. All right, so we're good. Let's open up our Bibles uh, to the book of Revelation. Uh, verse chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 1 and 2 in order to get started. All right, so it says this. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. What in the world is John talking about? What in the world is he trying to say? What in the world are we going to get from this verse or these two verses? First of all, before we get into it, I want to explain a certain word. It's found right here. It says that the writer has something on his head. uh, That something on his head is known as what? A crown. Now, I want you to know this crown that this writer has is a very unique crown. It's, it's the word that we know as Stephanos. So everyone, you can say that, and you'll know some Greek. Stephanos? There you go. Everyone knows Greek. Uh, pretty easy. Stephanos is a really interesting name, uh, not just a word, but a name. It's where we get the name Stephen from. It's where my last son was born after, uh, Esteban. That's his name. It's the same name, Stephen, Stephanos, uh, Esteban. It's all the same name. What does this mean? You're like, why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about names? What it means is this is the victor's crown. This is the crown that was given to the Olympic victors back in Greece. This is the the victor's crown of when they would win, they would receive a Stephanos crown. Now, in Revelation, keep this in mind whenever you're reading the book, because in English, we just read crown. But in Greek, there are two different types of crowns. There is the Stephanos crown, which is the victor's crown. And then there is the diadem, which is the ruling crown. We all are promised one day the Stephanos crown, the crown of victory. Here in the beginning, in chapter 6, we see that this rider and this white horse has, and he's wearing a Stephanos crown because he has achieved victory. Victory over what? 
What is he talking about? Well, in order to get started, in order to get a good starting point, let's go back a few chapters. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Because everything we're going to read today, everything you're going to hear today is built off of this. This is Jesus speaking to the church of Laodicea, and he says, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Jesus is inviting us, Jesus is inviting you and me to conquer with him. And when we conquer, we will receive what? A crown. When did this conquering start? Well, in order to look at when this conquering started, we have to go all the way back to the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew, chapter 27. Here in Matthew 27, if you have your Bibles, just turn there real quick. Here in Matthew 27, at the death of Jesus, I'm just going to sum up some of the story. At the death of Jesus, we see Jesus there hanging on the cross. And, and the Bible tells us, Matthew tells us, that during the sixth hour, it gets completely dark. And it gets completely dark for about three hours while Jesus is hanging there on the cross. Now, as he's hanging there on the cross, Jesus cries out a couple words in Aramaic. He says, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The soldiers, as they began to hear him crying out, some thought, oh, he's calling for Elijah. Others thought, oh, no, he's about to die. And so one of them grabs a sponge and he soaks it with vinegar and he tries to give it to Jesus so that he can drink it. And Jesus doesn't drink it. Instead, he breathes his last breath. And as he breathes his last breath, something happens. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. Verse 21, verse 51, Matthew 27, 51. It says this, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were also open, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the city and appeared to many. Do you catch what it's saying? That at the death of Jesus, when Jesus died, death is no longer able to hold a grip on many of the saints who had, had, had held captive during this time. And the graves split open. And the day when Jesus resurrects, those people resurrect with him as Jesus resurrects. I know many of us have overlooked this little detail, but this is really fascinating. Another thing I want you to understand is that at the death of Jesus, there are no Christians. There are no believers in Jesus, the way many of us have come to believe in Jesus. There is no one who is saying like, yes, he's going to rise again. No one thinks because you know what happens usually when you die? You stay dead. That's usually what happens. And so everyone, every single one of the disciples was expecting Jesus to stay dead. How do we know this? Because when Sunday comes, when Sunday morning comes, if they had believed that he was actually going to resurrect, this is what they would have done. At least this is what I would have done if I had believed, if I was among the disciples. I would have gone out in front of the tomb. I would have pulled up my nice little picnic chair. I'm going to move this so you guys can see me. I would have sat down about 10 minutes before sunrise. I would have crossed my legs, and I would have been waiting. And then I would have looked at the soldiers and I would have said something like, just you wait. It's going to happen. And then as the sun begins to rise, as it begins to come, we would have all started counting down and we would have been like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, cue the sun, 5, 4, Three, and voila, Jesus would have been there. We we're like, told you, we told you. We told you he was going to rise. But we don't see any of that. We absolutely see none of that. Because at Jesus' death, every single disciple had all their hopes, all their dreams about their earthly kingdom, their earthly aspirations, just completely shattered. And they lose hope. The only reason the women show up on Sunday morning is because they knew men wrapped this body and they're like, the men did a bad job. We need to go rewrap Jesus because the men did a bad job. So Mary, come on, grab your stuff. Let's go perfume him up and wrap him up. 
And they show up and they don't see anyone there. And they're in shock. They're in shock that he's not there. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears in the midst of them and he begins teaching and he begins preaching. And not just Jesus appears in the midst of them. Several of the saints that are raised in this moment at the resurrection also appear to the disciples. Because sometimes we think, man, like, man, those disciples had a lot of faith. But if you think about it, if you see someone like die, and then they're in the room talking to you, and then all these older dead saints that had died a long time ago are now in the room talking and teaching you about this guy who just resurrected, how much faith does it take to believe in this guy? Not much. He's right in front of you. And so here the disciples are, and they're, and they're listening to Jesus, and he's teaching them, and he's explaining to them. He's clarifying to them. He's clarifying to them how he has been here the whole time, how he's found in the Old Testament, how he's found, you know, in all the, all the, all the prophets wrote and spoke about him. And he does this for 40 days, for at least 40 days. And now we go, and here we are now in the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, because Jesus is preaching, and he's teaching, and he's showing them signs, and wonders, and miracles, and all these other people are teaching them, and teaching them, and showing them all these signs and miracles, and now here we are, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. It says this, speaking about Jesus, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from where? Jerusalem. He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem until when? Until the Holy Spirit appears to them. For he said, you heard me saying, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many what? Days from now. He's saying it's not going to happen right away. But you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. I just have to do something real quick. I have to go somewhere, and I have to do something. But you, you guys, stay put. Don't move. Stay in Jerusalem. And then Jesus continues. Now, what's interesting about this whole story, and what you should find interesting, at least I find interesting, at least humorous, is during the entire time, during the entire three and a half years that Jesus is preaching and teaching and sleeping and cooking, making him breakfast, doing miracle after miracle, disciples are healing. During this entire time, there is one main argument that disciples keep coming up, and it keeps coming up over and over and over and over again. Do you guys remember what that is? It's the, who's the greatest argument? It's the who's going to rule with you, Jesus? Who's going to rule with you when you come into your kingdom? When your kingdom comes, who's gonna be, who are going to be the head honchos? And what we notice here, and we're about to notice, is while all their hopes, dreams, and aspirations of being earthly rulers died at the crucifixion, they were all resurrected at the resurrection as well. And what it should remind us of is that our natural temptation to always pursue our own personal hopes, dreams, and desires over what God wants us to do. This is a natural pooling that we will always have and always wrestle with. And so we have to ask the question, is what we're doing something that God is asking us to do, is it th- or is this just me? Is this just me? And so here we go, and here we are. In verse 6, it begins to say to the disciples, it says, So when they had come together, they asked Jesus the same question. Lord, is it, is it now? Is it now you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I, I mean, we know that you had to die and resurrect, and you couldn't do it back then. But now you're here, and now we're here. And, and is now, can, like, am I going to be ruler with you? Is, is it Peter? He betrayed you, Jesus. Remember that. So it has to be one of us. And so is it, is it us? Is, is it John? Who is it, Jesus? And they're back to the same question. Is it now, Jesus? Are you now going to restore the kingdom? Are you now going to restore your earthly kingdom that we've been expecting? Are you going to do that now because we've waited three and a half years, and now we've waited 40 more days, and all that teaching and preaching about love and stuff, yeah, that's good, but, but we want to know who's going to rule. Can you just tell us who's going to rule, Jesus? So we can just settle things once and for all. And look at Jesus' response. 
He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, don't worry about it. Stop thinking about this. And then look at how he answers. Because I think he begins to tease them a little with some of their thoughts. He says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. To which I'm sure the disciples are thinking, Okay, I like, I like where this is going. Okay, I'm going to get power. Do you hear that? Do you hear that, James? You and me? Power. Remember when we wanted to burn that city down that rejected Jesus? Power, buddy. We will be able to do that now. We are going to receive power. And then he goes on. And you will be my witnesses. And they're like, okay, we like this witness. That's sort of like we represent you. We like this. Where are we going to be your witnesses, Jesus? And he's like, in Jerusalem. And they're like, yes, okay, preach, preach, Jesus. Come on, tell us, talk to us. Tell us more, Jesus. Tell us what we want to hear. And so Jesus is like, okay, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. To which now they're like, yeah, that's a little farther from like our hometown. Like we like the Jerusalem part, but, but Judea, those are like, those are those people. I guess, I mean, they're still Jewish. Okay, well, we can, we can do this. We can deal with this. Then look at the next one. In Samaria. Whoa! Whoa, Jesus. No, 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 no. I like power. We like being your witnesses. We like Jerusalem. We sort of like Judea. We'll make an exception. But Samaria? Like, are you kidding me? Like, like those people, those people? Like, they're not from here. Like, they're not part of us. We don't like them, they don't like us. So let's just keep it that way. And Jesus doesn't even end there. Doesn't even skip a beat. Yeah, Samaria. And if that bothered you, to the end of the earth. To which now the disciples probably have hundreds and thousands of questions. And each of them, they're raising their hands or whatever it is they did back in those days. And they're reaching to Jesus like, no, you put your hand down. He has to answer my question first. Like, I have a question. I have a... And they're all wrestling. And look at what happens next. Because I love this. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So now the disciples are there, and they're having all these questions, and Jesus, before he can even, they can even ask their question, he's just like, poof, and he vanishes. And the disciples are standing there, dumbfounded, staring out, trying to, oh, did he say what we think he said? Did he? And they're just staring up into heaven, they're like, yeah, um, uh, yeah, uh, about that. We have questions. Like, are you coming back? Like, what's going on, Jesus? Can, can you come back and answer something? Like, just clarify, maybe? Like, what, what's going on? They're so caught up in their own world that they don't even recognize when these two angels show up next to them. And the two angels look at them, and they're like, guys, the same Jesus that was taken up into heaven, he's going to come back. He's going to come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. And now, all of a sudden, now, at this moment in history, now, as Jesus is taken up into heaven, guess where we move to? We move to the book of Revelation, chapter 4, because that's the next scene. Revelation, chapter 4. This is before the falling of the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit comes down to earth, before Jesus is enthroned, before Jesus gets the Stephanos crown, which he's about to get, okay? It says this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door, verse 1, was standing open in heaven, and the first voice which had, I heard speaking said to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had an appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. Around that throne were how many people? Twenty-four elders. Clothed in white garments with what? Golden crowns on their heads. Anyone want to take a wild guess what word that word for crown is? Stephanos. 
victor's crown. Anyone want to take a wild guess at who these 24 elders are? Do you remember when Jesus resurrects? Who else resurrects? Many of the tombs were open, and many of the people came up with him. And when he ascends, even though we don't read it in Acts, we read it in the book of Ephesians where Paul tells us, don't you know that when he ascended up high, he led captives in his train? Don't you know that when he went up, he led a host of captives that he gave gifts, and he gave gifts to men? What is this meaning? What it's saying is, see, in ancient, in ancient war times, whenever a king would go and conquer another nation, in order to prove that he conquered that nation, he would have to bring forth the first fruits in order to bring back to his own home nation and show that he conquered it. So he'd be like, see, just to prove that I conquered that other nation, here are the captives that I set free. Where do we see this? We see this in the book of Daniel. When Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem, who does he take? Among them were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First fruits that Nebuchadnezzar leads on his train. And so now Jesus, Jesus has just come down. He has just died. He has just resurrected. And he has just won the victory. He has just conquered death. And in order to prove to the world, in order to prove to the universe that he has the power over death, he brings forth and leads captives on his train as he head back to heaven. And now we have our 24 elders who are there, which now makes sense why they fall down and worship him day and night and why they say, man, he is worthy. He is worthy. After this scene, after this scene, let's keep reading. Um, he looks around, and, and there's, there's these four living creatures who have six wings, and they're all flying about, and they're singing like the most repetitive contemporary song ever written. The words, they just repeat over and over and over and over and over. And I'm going to say it one more time. And over again. And they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And as soon as they sing this, all of a sudden the 24 elders fall down on the ground and they scream out in verse 11. They sing, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and are created. And then you guess, guess what they do when they're finished with that? The four living creatures sing again, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then the 24 elders fall down again, and they say, Worthy are you, Lord, for you created all things. Yet I don't see anyone looking at this part in Revelation and saying, That's enough. You're repeating that too much, angels. Knock it off. Can you stop worshiping God so repetitively? Can you stop worshiping him like that? Come up with a new verse. You don't see any of that. You know why? Because holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And because worthy is he, worthy is the lamb to sit on the throne. I often think and I often reflect that sometimes we don't recognize how holy God is and how worthy he is of our praise. Because when we, often when we come to areas of worship and places of worship, we make worship more about us than about him. And this should be a reminder that if, you're ever, if your mind ever wonders, like, I don't like this, that's okay. You know why? That song wasn't made for you. It was made for him. Not for you. So both the old hymns And some of the contemporary music was not written for us. It was written to worship him who is worthy, who is holy, 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 who is worthy to receive honor and praise from all creation because that's who he is. After this scene, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, John, John sees this scroll, and, the, and this scroll has seven seals, and, and, and the angels are wondering, like, who, who in the world is worthy to open this scroll? Why, why is no one there? And John starts crying, and he starts weeping, and he's wondering, like, is, is anyone going to be able to open this so we can see what's in this scroll? 
And one of the elders comes over and he whispers to John and he says, John, don't cry, buddy. The lion, the lion from the tribe of Judah, he has conquered and he is worthy to open the seals. So John turns and he looks and all of a sudden he, he beholds the lamb, a lamb that has been slain. And the lamb, and this is where we're going to pick it up, chapter 5, verse 6. It says this, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw the lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are what? The seven spirits of who? God sent where? To the earth. This is the moment in history when God's spirit is all of a sudden released into the earth. Meanwhile, the disciples in the upper room, they are praying and praying for the Holy Spirit. They have no idea what's taking place in the heavenly throne. And all of a sudden, we're captured back and we're brought back into the earthly story which is taking place. And so now we are back in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And it says this, At that day, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from where? From heaven, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is poured out on them. And they preach. And... Peter understands what's going on because he's filled by the Holy Spirit and he puts two and two together because in his speech, he actually declares what just took place in Revelation. Jump with me to verse 32 in chapter 2. This is Peter talking. This is Peter preaching. He says, this is the Jesus that God raised up and that we all were witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God... And having received from his father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this day that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Peter sees this. He sees the connection. And there's actually someone else who sees it too. His name is Stephen. Turn with me. Acts chapter 7. After Stephen finishes debating Paul and all the other Pharisees, Stephen, as he's about to be basically killed, he looks up into heaven and he says this, verse 55, chapter 7, verse 55. It says, But he, speaking of Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing where? At the right hand of God. This is the story we're reading in Revelation chapter 3 and 4. This is the story, I mean, chapters 4 and 5. This is the story. You have your heavenly scene, and then you have your earthly fulfillment. And you know what happens after the stoning of Stephen? Do you know what happens? Anyone? Where does Christianity go? To the world. How does Revelation describe it? Well, it describes it with the first two verses that we read. Look what it says. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, and he said with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out together, conquering and to conquer. You want to take a wild guess who this writer is? It's Jesus. Just so you know, when in doubt, the answer is Jesus. Okay? Jesus is the answer for the world today. You guys know this song. I can't sing it, so I won't sing it. When in doubt, the answer is Jesus. It's Jesus. And what's he doing? He's conquering. What does it mean for Jesus to conquer? It means to win people back to himself. And you know who he's using at this moment that he, when this was pinned? He just converted 
the strictest Pharisee from Saul to Paul. And he's using him to conquer the world. When you read the end of the book of Acts, when you read towards the end, Paul says, Lord, we have witnessed and preached to all the world and all the nations and every nation, tribe, and tongue. We have done your work. We are conquering. You want to know the amazing thing? He's not done. Jesus is not done conquering. You know who he wants to use now? You and me. You and me. And he wants to conquer this world once again. With a simple motive. To love. To love. I shared this first service, and I've shared this many times. My, my family is not Adventist, not Christian. Uh, they're really nice people. Uh, sometimes they're weird. Um, but they're really nice people for the most part. But one of the things that always bothers me when I'm with them, and, and they know this, I've talked to them about this, is they, they, don't, they, they don't understand what we mean when we say follow Jesus. They, they've seen some change. They, they understand that. And part of it, they're like, I like that. I, I like that. But they don't understand all the implications of that, what that means, not just in the future, but what that means today. And many of us, I often wonder, don't understand those implications either. Many of us don't know how good we have it to be part of a Christian community who looks out for one another. Many of us don't, will never understand what it's like to live in a world without hope. And many of us go around and we have this Christian understanding, we have this Christian faith, and we look at it and we hold it and we hold it tight and we're like, no, uh uh, this is mine. What's mine is mine. And I don't want to share. But here in the book of Revelation, Verses six, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, we see a conquering king. A conquering king who we claim to serve. A conquering king whom we claim to follow. And if our king is leading the charge and asking us to go and to go, then go we must. Because there's a world dying out there. There's a world in pain. I don't know how many of you saw the article this week about the pastor in Southern California who took his own life. Pain is real. And even in the midst of people who believe, it can still feel lonely sometimes. Even in the midst of preaching and teaching about Jesus, it can still feel lonely sometimes. Because the pain is real. And Jesus is looking at us and he's asking, what are we doing? Will you go? Will you go save my kids? I mean, what if it was your son? What if it was your brother? What if it was your sister? What is it if it was your husband or your wife? How far would you go? How far would you go? And yet, his kids are everywhere. And we sometimes seem oblivious to the fact that they're everywhere. And he's asking us to go. And he's asking us to join him in this conquest. So this is what I want us to do. This is your homework for today. Everyone has a phone book. Not the yellow pages. Not the one they drop off in your driveway and you throw away that same day. Not that one. Okay? Not that phone book. Your personal phone book. Okay, some of you have the old school phone book with like where you actually write. Yes, people still write, all you younger people, they still do that, all right? Some of you have one of those phone books. If you don't have that, you at least have a phone book in your phone. This is what I would like every single person to do. This is what I would like every single person to do today. So when you get home, before you go to bed tonight, I need you to get your phone book out. It might be your cell phone, it might be your actual phone book. And if you don't want to call, then I want you to at least text them. At least text. I want you to go through that list, and I want you to look at the names of people you haven't heard from 
in the past three months. People you haven't heard from in the past three months. And this is what I want every single one of us to do. I want you to ask at least one simple question. How are you doing? I haven't heard from you in a while, and I want to check up on you. How's life? That's all I'm asking. Because maybe if they begin to see that someone cares for them, maybe they'll begin to realize that God cares for them too. And maybe, just little by little, we'll begin to conquer once again. Let's bow our heads. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the words of Revelation. We thank you so much for Jesus being a conquering and victorious king. And we pray that you will help us to unite our efforts with his. We ask it all in his name. Amen.